you will be analyzing your uh, alcohol that you extracted using a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This, since it is spectroscopy, it is using light. Specifically, we are looking at light out in the radio frequency uh, range. So this is long wavelength, very low energy. In fact, similar wavelengths to what you have on an FM uh, radio dial. The basic principle behind nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is that nuclei uh, can behave a bit like a small magnet. And so if we put it in a magnetic field like a compass needle, it will align with the field. We can push it away from alignment using uh, radio waves, and that will push it out of equilibrium. When it returns in alignment, it will give off uh, radio waves. It gives off energy in the form of radio waves, and we can measure that. Now for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR, there are three things that we look at. One is chemical shift. This is uh, a modified frequency, but it is related to the environment of the nucleus. We look at integration. This gives us some quantitative information since the size of the peak, or specifically the peak area, is directly proportional to the number of hydrogens that we're giving that signal. And we also look at something called coupling or splitting. This gives us some information about how the various uh, hydrogens are connected to one another. So we will address these uh, one at a time, starting with chemical shift. The electrons around the nucleus influence the magnetic field, and they do change the frequency slightly. The frequency of the resonance for these hydrogens is dependent on the magnetic field. And so to make the um, NMR independent of the field strength, we normalize or adjust the frequency. And so when we report the frequency, we don't actually report a frequency in hertz. We report a modified frequency, which we call chemical shift. That way, it does not matter what the magnetic field strength was of the instrument we're using. The chemical shift will be the same for the same molecule, uh, regardless of the magnet. Uh, that uh, modified frequency, again, is called chemical shift. And the units are ppms which is part per million. And we use the PPM scale in a manner similar to that which we use the frequency scale in IR. We look at a particular range. For example, if we have a peak between about 0.7 to 1.8 ppm, this correlates to plain alkyl CH. If we have a peak between about 2 to 2.7 ppm, this is a CH on a carbon that is part of a double bond. For example, allylic CH. So we're looking specifically at a peak arising from this hydrogen, but notice that it is bonded or next to a carbon-carbon double bond. It is not part of the double bond. Down here we have vanillic. This hydrogen is directly bonded to one of the carbons of the double bond, and this has a different range. So this is next to. Likewise, we have benzylic. This is a CH next to a benzene ring, not the one attached to it. And it is true even if we're looking at a carbon-oxygen double bond as opposed to a carbon-carbon double bond. So this is a useful table to memorize. Uh, for this experiment, there are actually only uh, three regions that are of interest and really only two that are worth memorizing. One is the alkyl region, 0.7 to 1.8. The other is this alkoxy region, about 3 to 4.5 ppm. This is where we find a CH next to an electronegative atom such as oxygen. And since you are going to be using uh, or analyzing alcohols, this is a region that is of uh, importance. There is one other region that's of some interest, and that is for the OH. 
itself, although in this case we have a range 1.5 to 5 ppm that's too broad to be of any real use. So I will talk later when we are discussing actual spectra and looking at the interpretation. I will talk then about how to identify the peak that is coming from that OH. So here's an example of the way we use this. In this case, we have a peak here, about 2.0 ppm. And the units are not shown here, but again, the scale is part per million. And if we go back to our table, this is where we find the hydrogen. Of course, it's on a carbon here that is next to a double bond. And this could be a carbon-carbon or carbon-oxygen, carbon-nitrogen double bond, but uh, CH bonded to a uh, carbon double bonded to something. Out here in the 3.5 to uh, range is about 3.7 ppm, but again this is the alkoxy region, so this is where we have our CH that's bonded to an electronegative atom such as oxygen. And again, all of these peaks, since we are doing hydrogen NMR, are due to the hydrogen itself. But then this correlates with our structure. Our OCH here is, in fact, from this methyl group. Or the CH that's next to the double bond is, in fact, this methyl group, which is next to the carbonyl, the carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay, so we use the chemical shift to determine the type of hydrogen what it is adjacent to or part of. The second factor I mentioned is integration. The peak size, more specifically the peak area, so it's not just the height, but if a peak is broad, you would need to take that into account as well, but the peak area is directly proportional to the number of nuclei. If you think back to IR, in that case, peak size was more proportional to the polarity of the bond. But here it is quantitative in that it is directly proportional to the number of nuclei. So if one peak has twice the area of a second peak, it means that first peak has twice as many hydrogens, or is due to twice as many hydrogens as the second peak. This is uh, useful, in fact, we can need, do need to consider the fact that you cannot have fractional nuclei, so these ratios must be whole numbers. So we can identify a peak as being due to one hydrogen, or two hydrogens, or three hydrogens. The peak area gives us the relative number of hydrogens. We have an example here. Uh, now we have this trace that comes up and then across. And then we have another one here. This is sometimes referred to as an integral curve or an integral trace. You'll commonly see these on uh, spectra. What's important is that the height of that trace is directly proportional to the area of the corresponding peak. In the old days, we would actually take a ruler and measure these and get these values. More commonly these days, you will have something like this underneath the peak, where it will have some number. For example, it's 43 millimeters in height, so this would be 43, 17, and 26. So this is the relative ratio. We have uh, 43 to 17 to 26. This is not an absolute ratio. It is relative. To try to get this to some reasonable numbers, you would typically multiply one of these uh, numbers, the 43, the 17, or the 26, by some scaling factor based on what you presume the peak to be uh, representing. So if you think it's a CH3, you would multiply it by the appropriate factor to set it to 3, and you would do so. That same factor would be multiplied to, against all peaks. If you're dealing with a true unknown, so you have no clue what they are. What we typically do is divide each of these by the smallest. So 17 is the smallest. This gives us 1. 14 divided by 17 is 2.5. 26 divided by 17 is 1.5. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, you cannot have fractional hydrogens. One hydrogen is reasonable. Two and a half is not. One and a half is not. So when we see some, a ratio like this, typically we multiply everything by two. So this actually represents five hydrogens, two hydrogens, and three hydrogens. And so we have a ratio of then of five to two to three. And indeed, that is what uh, these numbers correlate to. Here we have five hydrogens. If we look at the chemical shift, this is the aromatic region, so these are the hydrogens on that benzene ring. And we do, in fact, have five hydrogens associated with that. This is two. That corresponds to this methylene, that is a CH2 group. And out here we have three. And again, this corresponds to a CH3. And if we look at the chemical shift here, too, is where we do expect to find a hydrogen bonded to a carbon next to a double bond, and again, a carbonyl double bond. So the third thing we look at is the coupling or splitting. At all the peaks we've looked at so far, we've seen a single peak. Something looks like this. We refer to that as a singlet. However, if the adjoining carbon has hydrogens, that peak will be split. So if there are, is, in fact, one adjoining or neighboring a hydrogen, it will be split into a doublet, get split into two peaks. If there are two neighboring hydrogens, it gets split into three peaks, something we call a triplet. And the number of peaks is one more than the number of NMR active nuclei on the adjacent atom. And this only applies, of course, to what we're going to be looking at as symmetrical uh, peaks. So this is an example, example of a doublet. Notice we have two peaks of roughly equal intensity. Hence, we have this one-to-one -one ratio. The triplet is a one-to-one -one ratio where that center peak is twice the size of these two outer peaks. And notice the outer peaks are of roughly equal intensity. Same thing with the quartet. We now have four peaks. Again, it is symmetrical. These two outer peaks are roughly the same intensity. Two inner peaks are roughly the same intensity. And the outer peaks are one-third the size of the two central peaks. Those two center peaks are three times the size. And this is a, a sextet. And again, we have a very specific ratio, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, where the very outer peaks are one-tenth the size of the inner. And then we have two more middle peaks, roughly equal intensity, that are half the size of the inner ones, or five times the size of the outer ones. You may be noticing a pattern here if you're familiar with Pascal's triangle. We have one to one, and then we can add the one and one together, we get two. So this is our doublet intensity, one to one. Triplet is a one, two, one. Quartet is one, three, three, one. If we have a pentet, then we would have 1, 3 plus 1 is 4, 3 plus 3 is 6, 4, 1. So that's the intensities for the uh, pentet. And again, this is Pascal's triangle, but notice the peaks are uh, symmetrical. And the spacing between the peaks is equal. If we saw a peak like this, this is not a triplet for two reasons. One, the distance between these two peaks is greater than the distance between these two. So this is not a triplet. Also, a triplet would be a one, three, one pattern. And here, two of the peaks appear to be about the same size. It looks more like a one, 
two-two pattern, which is not a triplet. But again, this tells us something then about the neighbors. Doublet means one neighbor. So that means we have a CH, and it is bonded to a carbon with one hydrogen. A triplet. Again, the peak is due to a hydrogen, and then the uh, triplet means there are two neighbors, which likely means it is bonded to a CH2. A quartet. Again, we have our CH, the peak that we're actually looking at, it, or the hydrogen that's giving rise to that peak. And quartet means three neighbors. Most commonly, this is a CH3. Now, while I have been drawing this as though there is just one neighbor with all the uh, hydrogens, that does not have to be the case. For example, we could also get a triplet if the hydrogens, uh, or excuse me, we can also get a quartet if the hydrogens are on separate carbons. So we could have a CH2 and a CH both bonded to that carbon. And so we still have three neighbors. Here we have three that are all on the same carbon. Here we have three that are spread out between two carbons. But it's still three neighbors, and therefore it would give a quartet. And that becomes especially relevant when we consider something like a sextet with five neighbors. Again, we have our CH, but we cannot have a CH5 providing those five neighbors. You cannot exceed four bonds on a carbon, so most likely this is a CH3 on one side and a CH2 on the other, and that would provide five neighbors. But again, even something like a quartet where you could have all three neighbors on one carbon, they could be spread out between two or even three. You could have a CH giving rise to the peak, and it is bonded to three CH1s, or three methine groups. So keep that in mind as we start looking at uh, some examples. So this is one example using the uh, splitting. Uh, before, as I mentioned, all of our peaks were singlets. Here, here we have a peak that is split into four. So this is a quartet. This is a singlet. And this is an example of a triplet. The quartet means three neighbors. Most common example is that means it's bonded to a CH3. Singlet means no neighboring hydrogens. And the triplet means two neighboring hydrogens. So then how do we put these pieces together? The first thing we're going to uh, do for, or the next step that we use for the assembly, is to look at the integrations. We measure the height of that integral trace, or that integral curve. We get a 1 to 1 and a half to 1 and a half ratio. Again, we can't have half hydrogens. So that means this represents two hydrogens, three hydrogens, and three hydrogens. In other words, this is a CH2. Remember, carbon can have four bonds total, so we'll write it this way. This is a CH3, and again, that means there's one more thing bonded to this carbon. Likewise, three hydrogens, so this is also a CH3. And again, carbon has four bonds, so this is bonded to one other thing. If we look at the splitting here, triplet splitting tells us that it's bonded to something with two neighboring hydrogens, so most likely bonded to a CH2. In fact, we have a CH2 here. So these two are likely bonded to each other. And any time you make those connections, you should check that it works out both ways. We do have a quartet here. Quartet means three neighbors, so it is bonded to a methyl group. And so this connection makes sense. 
Of course, if we started at this end, quartet, three neighbors, well, we've got two methyl groups. We have this one here, and we have the peak at 2.0, both of which represent methyl groups. So what if we had initially gone here? Again, if we look at the splitting, a singlet tells us there are no neighboring hydrogens. We know this is the wrong connection. The splitting here works well, quartet to CH3, but our CH3 is a singlet, so it is not bonded to a CH2, so we know that one's wrong. But this one fits. So at this point, we can start looking at chemical shift. This is around 4.0, but the range between 3 to 4.5 in our table means that this is bonded to an electronegative atom such as oxygen. This is the alkoxy region. At 2.0, this is the region where we find CH that's bonded to a carbon that is part of a double bond. So we have something of this sort. At about 1.2 ppm, this is alkyl, meaning this is bonded to another CH group of some sort. And so all of this makes sense then. We have these pieces. We would then put them together. We have our CH3 bonded some sort of uh, double bond. We also have our O CH2 CH3 and most likely scenarios these are bonded to each other and in fact we get this product that I've shown here the ethyl acetate and the peak at 1.5 this methyl group is in fact this one this CH3 is this one and our CH2 is that one right there what we do, don't know from NMR is what the nature of the X is, but uh, that's given here that it is indeed an oxygen. But from the NMR, you'll notice that we can get nearly an entire uh, structure. So NMR is more complicated than something like IR in that we have to consider not just the chemical shift or the frequency, we also need to consider the integration and the splitting but that extra information also gives us a lot more information to put together and is a much more powerful uh, technique in that we can often get a specific structure. IR, uh, for this compound, we would have basically that we have a bunch of CH, and from the carbonyl peak, we would know we have a ketone or ester of some sort, but that's it. We would not know which ester. From the NMR, we know specifically that it is ethyl acetate. So this is an example similar to what you will be seeing uh, for the spectra uh, for your product. Uh, again, notice that we have underneath, we have our integrations. Don't confuse these with the chemical shift. These are integrations. This is the chemical shift, which is the represented by the Greek symbol delta, and the units are ppm. But it is a scale underneath, the continuous one that shows chemical shift, and it's a little bracketed items that give the integration. And so with the integration, remember, now we have a total unknown. We don't know what any of these values should be, so to normalize it, the approach is to divide each of these by the smallest. 1.7 divided by itself, of course, is 1. 1.8 divided by 1.7 is going to be slightly greater than 1, but it's close enough we can round that to 1. And 10.2 divided by 1.7 is going to be equal to 6. So at this point, we have a hydrogen ratio. It is 1 to 1 to 6, and we also know that we have a product that has 8 total hydrogens. Again, this is 1 hydrogen, 1 hydrogen, and 6 hydrogens. Now, you are being told that this is an alcohol. Of course, if you had a total unknown, you might run an infrared spectrum first and find a strong absorption around 3400 
and use that to recognize the fact that you have an alcohol, which means one of these peaks is an OH. So how do we identify the OH? For all of these, it's a monoalcohol. That means there is only one OH, which means the integration will be 1. So we have to look for a peak that integrates to 1. We have two of them. A second thing that we typically find with OH, that OH peaks are usually singlets and often a broad peak, although you will see examples where it can be somewhat sharp. But in this case, we do have a peak that is broad. We don't have any clear splitting for the peak, and it does integrate to 1, so this is our OH peak. So what about the other two? If we look at the chemical shift, this is around 4.0. Again, remember, this is the alkoxy region, so that means this is an OCH. Integration is 1, so this is CH1, and of course, carbon can form two other bonds. Out here, we have a peak, about 1.2 ppm, so this is the typical alkyl region, six hydrogens, we're not likely to have a CH6 since carbon cannot form six bonds. So this is almost certainly going to be two methyl groups, two CH3 groups. So at this point, we have this information based on chemical shift, the alkoxy. The broad peak at 1.6 is our hydroxy, and the tall doublet that integrates to 6 would be two methyl groups. And so we'll draw out those pieces in this format. And then the next step is how do we put the pieces together? And for that, we use our splitting. And so if we look at this, we definitely have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's not real clear, but if you look closely, you'll find that we actually have two more tiny little peaks there. So this is seven peaks. This is a septet. So seven peaks. That means the number of neighbors is one less. So this would be six neighboring hydrogens. Other peak that we would look at would be this one here. We have two peaks. So this is a doublet, meaning there is one neighboring hydrogen. And so all that remains then is to put the pieces together. Obviously, if this is our alcohol, that hydrogen belongs there. Septet, six neighbors. How do we get six neighbors? The most logical way is that we have uh, two CH3s that this is bonded to, meaning that one of these is bonded to one of the methyls and the other bond goes to the other methyl. And of course we always want to double check. The doublet, meaning one neighbor, that means these methyl groups are bonded to a CH. And so indeed this is a CH, this carbon has only one hydrogen. And so that accounts for this being uh, a doublet. And so we have this structure here. Now, when you are discussing the NMR, you will need to include an interpretation in your discussion section. In addition to explaining what the splitting and chemical shifts mean and how you're deducing your structure, you do need to make specific assignments assign particular hydrogens to particular peaks. And so for that, we need to label our hydrogens. And so we will go through HA. So this peak is a result of hydrogen A. This one, hydrogen B. And then the two methyl groups, because they arise from the same peak, 
we give them the same label. If they are separate peaks, give them separate labels, but since both methyl groups are arising from the same doublet, we would give them the same label, and so we would label both of those C. And then when we do our discussion, we can refer to the doublet at 1.2 ppm correlating to hydrogen C. It's, the, it's easier than trying to describe a particular hydrogen on a molecule, especially larger molecules. All right, so we'll look at one more example. <clears throat> this one's a little more complex than the last one. But again, remember that the values here, the ones that are bracketed under the peaks, represent integrations. And as denoted here, this scale represents chemical shift. So this peak here is at about 3.7 ppm. It is not at 1.47 ppm. That is an integration. And again, we are dealing with an unknown. So we will divide each of these integrals by the smallest, 1.47 divided by 0 0.70 tells us that this is roughly two hydrogens. 0.7 divided by itself is going to be one hydrogen. Then we have this quartet, 1.58. Again, divide by 0.7. Get a value slightly greater than two, but it's close enough that we can simply round it two hydrogens, one hydrogen, and 4.2 divided by 0.7 is 6 hydrogens. And so we now have a, a hydrogen count for each of these peaks. That's shown here. Again, we could also add all these up. 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 more is 5, 6, 12. So we have a compound that has a total of 12 hydrogens. We can look again at chemical shift. Uh, one of the first things we want to do is consider which of these peaks is our OH. Because again, we are dealing with an alcohol. Uh, you're being told that, but in the absence of that knowledge, you could use an infrared spectrum. So again, we're looking at a peak that has an integration of one. We have two such peaks. This one was one hydrogen, and this one is one hydrogen. But the second criterion for whether or not a peak is OH is that we almost never see splitting between the OH and anything adjacent to it. Those are almost always singlets, so that takes this out of play. So the singlet here is going to be our OH. So this peak is our alcohol. And then we would use chemical shift to determine the other peaks. Again, this is out here around uh, 3.7 ppm. This is uh, in the alkoxy region. So this is our OCH. Specifically, because the integration is 2, it is an OCH2. And so this is OCH2. And all of the rest of the peaks are within that 0.7 to 1.8 range where we find alkyl CH. So we have these pieces here. And from the shifts, we have then uh, those particular groups. We have our alkoxy identified. We have the OH, and the others are all alkyl groups. And then the next question is, how do we put these together? Of course, we'll start with the obvious one. Since this is the alkoxy, that oxygen will be the alcohol. And so this gets bonded to it. And we get this fragment here. So now we have an OCH2. So what else is this carbon bonded to? Carbon has four bonds. We see three of them, two to hydrogen, one to oxygen. If we look at our splitting here, this is a triplet. Triplet means two neighbors, which means this is bonded to a CH2. If we look at the other pieces, we have a CH1. We have a CH2, so this is a possibility. 
CH3 and CH3. So the only thing this can be bonded to is that methylene. And so now we have this fragment. Of course, we always want to uh, double check our work. So here, this is the CH2 we just added. This is a quartet. Quartet means that there are three neighboring hydrogens. So if we look at what we actually have, we have two neighboring hydrogens. It's supposed to have three, which would mean it's bonded to one more. So we would expect to have a CH1 on this side. Question then is, do we have a CH1? And yes, we do. So this could be bonded to that CH. In fact, it is the only CH that we have here. And so now we get to this fragment. So, so far everything makes sense. Triplet bonded to two neighbors. We've got our two. Quartet bonded to three neighbors, and we have two, three. So far, so good. So let's look at the next one. We have this peak here, and this one becomes a little more difficult. We definitely have one peak in the center, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can clearly see seven peaks, but it is possible there are two more, which leaves us the question, is this a septet, meaning uh, six neighbors, or is it a nonnet, meaning eight neighbors? Could be either one. It could be that there are two more little peaks out at the edges that we can't see. It's definitely at least a septet, possibly nonnet. So there are a couple of approaches. One we can consider what do we already have. So we have for this hydrogen, we already have two neighbors. If it is a septet, it will have six, meaning there should be four more. We don't have anything left that has four hydrogens. In fact, we have only two, met two methyls. So this does not seem likely. So probably not a septet with six neighbors. What about nonet? Does this one make sense? Nonet is eight neighbors, which would mean, since we already have two, that we would have another six. In fact, that matches very well with the fact that we have these two methyls out here. So that all seems to fit. And of course, we want to make sure that this part also matches. So we can look at that last peak. It is, in fact, a doublet, meaning that there is one neighboring hydrogen. Those methyl groups are bonded to a CH which in fact fits. So it's bonded to a CH, which is why it's a doublet, bonded to a CH. And again, that indicates we have a nonet with eight neighboring hydrogens. We've got two, three more is five, three more is eight. And so all of the splitting fits, and we have a final structure. Again, we always want to label our hydrogens, and so we would start labeling those. And again, notice that since we have one peak and both methyls are from the same peak, both methyl groups have the same label. Labeled one E, the other is also labeled E. But other than that, we can simply start at one end and start lettering. So this is how you interpret an infrared, or excuse me, a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum. Probably the best place to start is with the integration. Set the smallest value to one and determine what the others are. If you're getting a half, you'll probably want to double everything so that you have whole number ratios. And again, you may not get exact whole numbers, but they should be close so that you can evaluate that and uh, round as necessary to get the values. That tells you whether you're dealing with a 
CH2 or CH1 or CH3 or possibly two CH3s but it gives you that integration so you can determine that. Then use chemical shift. Identify your OH since you're dealing with an alcohol. Then look at chemical shift to identify your alkoxy, the OCH, and whether it's an OCH or an OCH2. And then use the splitting to determine what is bonded to what to get a final structure. And don't forget to label uh, the hydrogens. And keep in mind when we are uh, referring to the labels, those are to the hydrogens, not peaks. We do not refer to a peak, for example, we would not call this peak A. Peaks already have labels. That is the chemical shift. If you're going to refer to a peak, you refer to it, for example, as the uh, triplet at 3.7 ppm. Or sometimes you'll see it written as delta 3.7. But that designates the fact that uh, you're looking at a peak at 3.7. But we always use chemical shift when we refer to a peak. It's a peak at 3.7, or the peak at 1.7, or the peak at 1.4. We do not refer to peak A or peak 1. Always use chemical shift. Port guidelines, same as before. Abstract, remember this will be a fairly uh, short paragraph stating what you were trying to do and how you did it and what your results were. Again, when you are uh, stating your objective, we do not make it explicit. We do not say the objective was to dot dot dot. Rather, we express our objective by stating what we did. For example, you might say an alcohol was extracted from an aqueous solution. There you're stating what you did. The alcohol was identified by nuclear magnetic resonance. That was, of course, an objective to do that identification, but we don't state it in that way. We do not say the objective was to identify. But rather, we say the alcohol was identified. And then we state the method, nuclear magnetic resonance, and you would state the results. What was your alcohol? The alcohol was identified as isoamyl alcohol, or 3-methylpentane-1-ol. If you have a yield, you would give a percent yield as well. And yields are always expressed as percents in the abstract. The actual mass or volume is uh, useless. To say you got one gram of product is kind of meaningless because we don't know what that represents. If you started with one gram of reactant, then one gram of product is a great yield. On the other hand, if you started with a kilogram of product, a thousand grams, and you only got one gram, then you have a very poor yield. So simply stating a mass or a volume is meaningless. It doesn't convey any real useful information. On the other hand, a percent yield, if you say I got a 98% yield, we know what that means. If you got a 0.1% yield, we know that's not very good. So for this experiment, you did not perform a chemical reaction, so you don't have an equation, but you will have the structure of two alcohols. The alcohol that you extracted in lab, but also the additional unknown that was assigned to you. So you will have two unknown structures that you do need to uh, draw. You do need to make sure that structure is proportionate with the rest of the text. So a structure of this size would be fine. Notice the font in the structure is roughly the same size as the uh, font that I'm using for the uh, text. So this would be an appropriately sized structure given the size text that I have in this presentation. On the other hand, this structure is much too large. The font size in the structure is much greater than that of the text, and so this would be inappropriate. You do need to size the structures appropriate for the rest of the text that you have in your report. Procedure, third person passive voice, an account of what you did. 
with sufficient detail for another student at your level to repeat what you did. So when you're talking about extraction, it is sufficient to say that you extracted an aqueous solution. You don't need to say you put it in a separatory funnel, that you swirled, that you mixed the layers, that you separated the layers. That's excessive detail. A student at your level should know what it means to do an extraction. And when you say it was extracted, you imply that they were mixed in a separatory funnel and the layers were subsequently separated as well. All of that is implied with the term extraction. However, you do need to state the volume that you used. It can make a difference if you use 10 mils or 20 mils or 100 mils, so specify the volume. It also makes a difference what solvent you used. There are any number of solvents that could be used. You could have done your extraction with uh, chloroform or methylene chloride or ether or ethyl acetate. So you would need to specify something like the aqueous solution was extracted with 10 mils of ethyl acetate. So volume and the uh, extracting solvent do need to be given. Also with the procedure, when you talk about uh, drying your solution, a person at your level should know what it means to dry a solution and you should know how it is done. So it is sufficient to state that the solution was dried with sodium sulfate or calcium chloride or whatever reagent you used. You do need to specify the drying agent that you use since there are a number of different drying agents that one can use. However, it is not necessary to state the amount. In fact, one almost never measures the amount that, of drying agent that you put in. You simply add enough to get the solution dry. And a student at your level at this point should be able to tell if they have added sufficient drying agent. So it is enough simply to state that it was dried with whatever drying agent you used and more detail is not necessary. If you have yields, of course you report that in percent yield. If you measure melting points or boiling points, of course you give those along with the uh, literature value. Uh, one other item that's important here as you will recall from the infrared experiment, at the end you do give a summary spectral data line. We do the same thing with NMR. Identify the particular compound, 3-methylbutane-1-ol. We identify the spectral technique. With IR you said IR. We give the medium. For IR you did these on salt plates so you had NaCl. <coughs> You give the frequency, for IR it was inverse centimeters. For NMR, typically we're doing this in a solvent. Uh, if you prepare the sample, of course, you'll know what it is. For the alcohols, you can assume that the solvent was deuterochloroform, CdCl3. The D represents the heavy isotope of hydrogen, so it's H2. We do not use solvents in NMR that contain hydrogens because then, of course, the solvent itself will appear in the spectrum. And since we usually use a large amount of solvent and only a small amount of the solute, then that peak would dominate everything else. And uh, so we use solvents that have deuterium instead of hydrogen on them, and the common one is deuterochloroform. Now for units, it is ppm. But because we are not measuring a direct frequency, usually frequency is given in vibrations per uh, period of time, vibrations per second or hertz. In IR, we do it vibrations per centimeter. Uh, in this case, though, it's not really a direct frequency. We're reporting a chemical shift, and so we use that Greek symbol delta. And so that indicates that we are using a proxy for our chemical shift and this is the lowercase uh, delta. To make this in Word, you could simply type a lowercase d, highlight it, and then change the text to the symbol font or a Greek font, and you should get the delta symbol. After that, we report our peaks. For IR, we simply gave the frequencies. So example, 3400, 2960, something of that sort. 
For NMR, we report three things. The first one is the chemical shift. The second is the splitting. And the third is the integration. So this is a peak at 3.7 ppm. The T means it's a triplet, integration two hydrogens. Then we use a semicolon to separate the next item in the list. And again, 1.7 ppm, nonet two hydrogens. 1.4 ppm, quartet two hydrogens. Common abbreviations, S is singlet, D is doublet, T is triplet, Q is a quartet, we do have a symbol M that we can use for multiplet. Multiplet is used when we cannot tell what the splitting is. Typically, this results or occurs when we have overlapping peaks. So we may have a triplet sitting on top of a quartet, but at that point we have a bit of a mess and so we can't really tell. We call it a multiplet. Anything greater than a quartet, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, you always spell it out. Pentet, sextet, septet, octet, nonet, spell out the word, don't use an abbreviation. For the calculations, you are not doing a chemical reaction, so you do not have to worry about limiting reactant. However, you do have a theoretical yield, or if you prefer, a theoretical uh, recovery that you can have. You are to assume that you started with 1.00 milliliters of alcohol in the solution that you were extracting. And so you can convert that to grams of alcohol. And that would be your theoretical yield, the amount of alcohol in grams that you should be able to recover. And then percent yield, or if you prefer, you can think of this as a percent recovery. But the calculation or the equation is the same. Percent yield or percent recovery, whichever you want to call it, is equal to the actual amount, so the mass of alcohol that you measured after rotary evaporation, divided by the theoretical amount. So the amount that you calculated before that you could, in theory, recover. And of course, that's times 100%. For the discussion, all spectral data must be presented in tables. You did this for the infrared spectrum. You will do it again for the NMR spectrum. First column should be chemical shift. The item should be listed in sequential order, either ascending or descending, but definitely in order of chemical shift. Second column is the hydrogen type, so the peak at 0.9 was alkyl, 1.3 was hydroxyl. You will have one of three sets in your table for the alcohols. It will either be an alkyl CH, it will be the hydroxyl hydrogen, or the peak will represent the alkoxy. So it should be one of those three labels. A splitting for the next column, same abbreviations, D for doublet, S for singlet, etc. Larger ones above uh, quartet, spell it out. So peak at 1.7 was nonet. We do not put an N, we spell it out. Integration, these are the whole number values. So while the spectrum itself may have a number like 0.7 and 1.4, you do not report the numbers on the spectrum. You report the whole number values after you uh, normalize it. So at 0.7 would be one hydrogen. 1.4 would represent two hydrogens. So the integrations should be the whole number values. And then the last column would be the assignment. And these are the assignments we made earlier where the two methyl groups were assigned hydrogen E, and you show which assignment goes with which peak. Of course, that requires that you also have a labeled structure. So like this, you do need a structure with the hydrogens labeled and again, this must be done with some kind of chemical drawing package, such as uh, chem sketch, but no hand-drawn uh, structures or even labels. When you discuss your table, the discussion should be able to stand independent of the table. 
meaning you need to tell what is there and you need to interpret it. So an example for that would be here, starting off by telling us what is present. There is a peak at 3.7 ppm. Peak is a triplet with an integration of two hydrogens. So this tells what is there, then interpret it. This is in the alkoxy region. So the peak at 3.7 is alkoxy region, indicating the peak is for the OCH2. The splitting indicates there are two neighboring hydrogens. So tell us what the chemical shift means, tell us what the splitting means, and then draw a conclusion. This peak corresponds to hydrogen B. And you should have a short paragraph like this for every row in your table. Identify the peak, give the chemical shift, give the splitting, give the integration, and then tell us what each of them means. And then you should be able to uh, draw a final structure. And so for the summary, we'll just summarize the results. Mention uh, which alcohol you had for the experiment, but also which alcohol that you had for the unknown. And of course, you would also mention in the summary, since we are summarizing results, what your uh, percent recovery was. And if it's not a high recovery, you might speculate as to what might have gone wrong. In particular, did you spill something? Uh, did you leave it in the rotary evaporator too long, etc.?